welcome to the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast. I'm Amanda McCrossin, and I am here to tell you that I am fully and truly and wholeheartedly obsessed with Tuscany. I've been here three times in the past two years, and I have to say I can't get enough. I want to go back. I've learned so much. But the thing is, even as much as I've learned and as much as the fact that I've been there three times, how is that even possible? I still feel like I'm only cracking the surface. Like we're only just getting to know this region. And so many of you have asked me questions about traveling there, about the wines there. In the last episode, I talked about how I think Chianti Classico is definitely one of these wines that Americans are going to start paying more attention to or should start paying more attention to. So I decided to bring in some reinforcements. And I was lucky enough on my last trip to meet a guy who knows a little something about Tuscany. Um, I think he knows a lot about Tuscany, actually. And he was born in Florence. He's worked as a psalm. Uh, He also is like a psalm to the stars. Like if you look at his Instagram, there's like all these famous people just littered everywhere. So please welcome to the show, Filippo Bartolotta. Nice to see you. Ciao. Nice to see you. (laughs) (laughs) We met in the best way possible. Do you recall this? Of course I recall. <laughs> I mean, how can you not recall meeting uh, Amanda on the Turi in the Turi Fell yes. drinking? Do, can we see what we were drinking? Yeah, that was of pretty course. unusual. Yes. We were having like this amazing uh, Lambrusco evening, and uh, we just happened to be neighbors during right. dinner, and that was wonderful. that's right. You escorted me in because I was I was filming some footage. Uh, you squirted me in, in my video, which was very sweet. Um, yeah, that was a wild, wild two days where the the consortio was kind enough to fly a few of us in to celebrate World Lambrusco Day. And they decided to like rent out the Eiffel Tower because that's a normal thing that people yeah. do. Um, so we did this whole like masterclass on the second floor. And then we went up to the Jules Verne restaurant and Philippe and I were uh, we were dining partners in the Eiffel Tower on Solstice, and it was a beautiful setting and a beautiful way to meet a new friend. And then the craziest part is we're sitting across from each other at dinner, and we're talking about like you know the next like what are you up to the next few days? And he's like, oh, I'm heading to Tuscany. I was like, I'm heading to Tuscany. He's like, oh, I'm hosting these American wine influencers, and I was like, I'm an American wine influencer. Who are you hosting? And it turned out that you were hosting me, so we got to see each other twice at Fontodi, no less. Yeah, it was awesome because we said like, well, we should do something together. Yeah, you know, you know how you do like that. Well, I'll keep in touch. And then yeah. next thing, you are in Tuscany, right in the heart of Chianti Classico. Yeah. So that was mashing. I mean, the, the sunset in, in, in inside the Tour Eiffel was quite something. I mean, I've been there several times, but that, that was amazing. And just to be with all the wine friends and, and, and some pretty remarkable uh, Lambrusco di Sorbara. I love this yes. stuff. But we have to talk about Tuscany now. Shouldn't we'll talk about been... Tuscany. I know. You're born there. I get it. You're the Tuscan guy. And you gave us a, you gave us a great Tuscan masterclass on blending. I feel like I learned a lot about uh, Chianti Classico at that at that session. You do a lot. I think a, a little like me, when people ask you, you know, what do you do for a living? Like, what do you tell them? I'm a journalist. I write a lot about wine. Mm-hmm. I, I, I do a lot of... Uh, Social media as well. Uh, during COVID, I've, I've been doing a lot of crazy, crazy videos that, you know, when I look back at what I did, like, I was like, shit, like, how did I have that, that kind of courage? <laughs> but that, that was a great moment for me because I started to use more video production. So I did a lot of uh, TV afterwards. And uh, my main job right now is to work as a, as a wine educator, really, more than anything else. And I love it. Yeah. I prepare a lot of... Uh, seminars and masterclasses uh, about Italian wines uh, from Sicily all the way to the Alps. Um, and most of these, these seminars are for psalms and wine journalists and, and uh, um, influencers and, and, you know, like importers, mainly for press and trade. But I do a lot of yeah. uh, entertaining events as well for companies. Recently, I had Jennifer Garner that was actually in Tuscany. Oh, I and saw. Did, uh, and then, <laughs> entertaining oh you saw that that, that was good she's yes. she's awesome she's, she's great yeah you had jennifer garner then i saw well i know that you you've been on the stephen colbert show talking about wine yes. and you've like you've served and, wine to the obamas yes i mean all great people to be all, i mean i've been fortunate enough like not just you know like uh you can flex you know the celebrities whatever but like they they, they were all like amazing people i mean jennifer yeah uh, was really sweet with her friends and and the Obamas. They couldn't uh, 
have been any sweeter and and kinder to all of us. Their presence was was phenomenal. It was two and a half hours tasting. I, I wasn't expecting to, wow. to be so involved with it. And uh, well, Stephen Colbert in the Ed Sullivan Theater, that was bonkers. I mean, he's That's such crazy. a witty, great energy person. So yeah, like like good people, and you know, this is the secret. Now, you know, this is the perfect glue. The juice, it, the juice brings people. That's the whole premise of this podcast. Is like you know, just drink a little wine and get people talking, and it should be a good conversation because yeah. you know, a, a lubricated conversation is a good conversation. Yeah. We're gonna get into Tuscany in just a minute, but before we do that, let's talk about what's going on in the world of wine. Well, there's a place called Pritchard Hill. It's an it's not an official AVA in Napa Valley, but it's this place that's sort of become known as the Rodeo Drive of Napa Valley. It's where like yes. very expensive wines are made up there. Bryant family, mm -hmm. Colgan brand, oh, Chapelet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I I've been I, I visited Chapelet. Fantastic Chardonnay, I remember. Yes, yes. Beautiful place. And one of the original properties on Pritchard Hill. So much so that they, uh, they're they the only ones that can actually have the name Pritchard Hill on their label. They've they've trademarked and, and copyrighted it. So you won't yeah. see it on a label. But there's one property in particular in Pritchard Hill that uh, after years of being in the market, I'm talking like this first was reported that it was for sale in 2015 for a whopping $50 million. Someone finally, finally just bought. It's 128 acres 42 of which are planted. I know the price went up another $5 million in 2019. So let's oh, extrapolate wow, wow. from there in 2023. And we can kind of, you know, figure out maybe what that price was. But it finally sold uh, to a former petroleum industry executive, Brian Wise, yeah. who now owns about 2,000 acres uh, in, I think, in Napa Valley. Um, but he just bought this property and, uh, I don't know, I'm very, I'm very curious about what they're going to do. But my question to you is like, yeah. you know, are you seeing sales like this in Tuscany, like of this magnitude or it's like, that's just not a thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, I can think already about, uh, like a winery, uh, that was cap three wineries that were purchased recently, like, uh, yeah. for bonkers money. Uh, some of which actually we don't really know how much, but we talk. You know, one was uh, Biondi Santi, the other one, oh, uh, the famous, uh, you know, the producer, the, the inventor of Brunello di Montalcino. That's right. Uh, the other one was Isole Olena, which was sold mm -hmm. for millions, tens of millions of euros. Mainly, it's like Brunello di Montalcino and Chianti Classico are the two top-notch uh, appellations, and that's where you have uh, not only uh, smashing uh, vineyard sites, but also what brings the price up is the uh, real estate. You know, we're talking about uh, areas where you can uh, come across a cellar and next to the cellar, you have an 11th century original castle right. <laughs> with frescoes uh, of, you know, the 15th century. So, so that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, um, transactions are happening. And as a matter of fact, the, the last uh, six, seven years, we saw a lot of that going on. If I am going to buy a winery, I think I, I mean, not that Pritchard Hill isn't beautiful, but I feel like if I'm going to buy it, I'm going to, I might go to Tuscany and get some like cool old stuff with it as well. Like get, get a piece of history, right? Some, some yeah. frescoes well, and yeah. Give me a shout if you do. <laughs> <laughs> if I come into some money. One thing that is happening in Napa Valley that maybe isn't happening in Tuscany as much is the price of wine is continuing to go up. So it was just reported that bottles of Napa Valley wine are up $17 a bottle over last year to make the average price of a Napa Valley wine $108 a bottle. The tasting fees are also on the rise. Again, Whoa. another thing that you're not seeing as much in Tuscany. Our tasting fees here in Napa Valley are now 35% higher than they were last year. You want to take a you can take a wild guess as to what the average price of a tasting a tasting fee is in Napa right now? Uh 50 bucks. $30 higher than that, $81 is the average price of a tasting in Napa Whoa. for one person. And uh, yeah, and I want to point out, you know, one of the things that I loved so much in Tuscany is like, you know, it's so, it's so, it's so perfect, right? You go there and like you taste wine, but a lot of these places are also offering like culinary experiences with their tasting. So like- Usually if, they do, yeah. Exactly. Here in Napa, that's all, you're just getting the wine. 
So it's it's really <laughs> hard to do food here in Napa because of the county restrictions. So, um, I mean, not to like shit on Napa because I live here and I, I love it here, but like $81 to go and taste wine is a lot of money. And when you consider people are coming here for like, you know, five days, six days, whatever, and they're usually doing two to three tastings a day. I mean, that that adds up and that's not even including the wine that they're purchasing, the hotels that they're staying at, the dinners that they're going to. Um, so things are getting wildly expensive in Napa. And by contrast, interestingly, because I know everybody likes to kind of lump them together, Sonoma, by contrast, is um, is about half the price. So $57 is the average price of a bottle of Sonoma wine. Uh, $38 is the average price of a tasting there. I drove to Sonoma from San Francisco. It was fantastic on the mm. one, uh, was that the 101 or the one? The 101. In, you know, yeah, fantastic. I loved it there. Yeah, but in Tuscany, yeah. you know, it's happening. So you have a, some of the small family-run businesses. There are sometimes they don't even charge for for the for the tasting. But like, if you go to the famous wineries in Bulgaria, like the you know, like the big brands, mm -hmm. you can you can go in with the hundred bucks as well. Uh, but the average, uh, yeah, the average, you know, on average, you can go anything between fifteen to fifty euros. Uh, then that would include, uh, then of course, if you go for vertical tastings or things like that, that you go higher, but usually people will include uh, maybe, yeah. uh, some charcuterie, some little cheese and, and some crostini, you know, because it would be rude not to, right? <laughs> yeah. Italians don't, um, seldom they, they would have a glass of wine without any food. So it's kind of like part of the culture. Um, yeah. it's, it's like a healthy habit, I guess, you know, you coat your stomach and everything, you just get less hammered, uh, you know, like, a, yeah. and, uh, and it's, it, it is, it is a uh, habit. you know, people usually, uh, have their wines with the aperitivo and so little nibbles and, uh, and that's, uh, it just makes it, uh, more convivial. That was one of the things that made me fall in love with Tuscany is just this idea, like how intertwined food and wine is. It's amazing. I mean, it's something we really don't do enough of here in the U.S. that the Italians have been doing for centuries. Uh, so I, you know, I think if we're going to increase our tasting room prices, like we got to find a way to work food in. One thing that you may, you probably know because you're so uh, entangled with the Tuscan wine scene. Um, it looks like Ornelia is going to be uh, replacing their winemaker, Olga Fusari. Fusari? Um, she's been the winemaker for the past 10 years at Ornelia. She's leaving and going to Rufino. Have you heard this? Oh yeah. Yeah. I know them very well. I, every year I, I've been doing for the past three years, the world launch of the new Ornelia mm. vintage, uh, oh. with, uh, actually Axel Heinz used to be the main winemaker and he left quite, you know, taking everyone aback, uh, a few months ago. And and afterwards, just that was a week ago, ten days ago, Olga uh, left as well. So mm. that that comes a little bit. Uh, it's kind of a surprise. Like every you know, uh, we we've been hearing this news with without any warning, and uh, there's going to be some reshuffling going on there. Mm. Uh, the Frescobaldi family is the owner of the company, so they're they're long established family. Uh, so we'll, we'll need to get to know more. I haven't been back in the winery since uh, uh, Axel uh, and Olga left, uh, but now I'm even more curious. I should be going doing some tasting about the whole region, the, the wines of Bulgari, uh in a month. Two back-to-back -back sort of sudden departures, does that signal anything? I was a bit, I was a bit surprised. I mean, I'm sure the Frescobaldi is like, uh, they've been making wine for 800 years or something. Yeah. So they, <laughs> they they know the craft and everything. It's just been... Yeah. A little surprising how they handled it with mm. regards to the fact that, you know, Ornelaya uh, and Maceto are blue chips in the wine right. world, not in the Italian wine scene. You know, those two wines are always, uh, you know, in the, in the live ex in London, you know, like we're talking about, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of euros, uh, you know, Maceto goes towards the thousand. Yeah. Uh, so it was surprised. I was surprised how how I was taken aback how how this transaction wasn't managed maybe mm. uh, more smoothly. I would say. Yeah, and I will say they they sort of swept the news under the rug. Like from a PR standpoint, 
this was this was news I had to dig for. Like it wasn't on the front page of anything. Nobody was really talking about it. I I literally saw it. I think this article is in the um Bulgari Italian news. Like it it really did not did not leave Italy and it did it did not make it over here. I I, I wrote a piece on uh on the drinks business the day after after it happened. Mm. Um but it was uh every, you know everyone was shocked. I mean I I it it took me 24 hours before I decided to release the news because it was pretty bonkers and I I I called the Marchese uh, Lamberto Frescobaldi to uh, have his take on it Axel I didn't get much to be honest mm. f- from them with guys you know Frescobaldi said of course this is uh, this was something planned and uh, you know our the team is a big team is a large team so well and as you said it i mean these are these this is a blue chip winery right so the show definitely goes on it's not like anybody is terribly worried when a winemaker leaves a first growth bordeaux or even a napa valley you know we're not terribly concerned when there is a shuffle yeah, yeah. for those of you who are part of the wine access unfiltered podcast wine club this is your moment to grab that 2017 Cantina di Montalcino. This is a Brunello di Montalcino. So, of course, we'll be talking about all things Sangiovese. Filippo already hinted at the fact that uh, one of the OG producers, Biondi Santi, um, is, is in Montalcino. So we're going to be talking about that region along with Chianti Classico, Montepulciano, maybe some Bulgari. Who knows? It's going to be a fun, a fun, fun conversation. And uh, this is also my time to remind you that if you're not part of the Unfiltered Wine Club, well, this is your chance to do it. We're having a lot of fun. Four bottles every two months, 120 bucks, including shipping. And then you get 10% off of all of your purchases at Wine Access. Um, and then the other thing I should mention, because you know, you're listening to this, you're loving it. You love Filippo. You're so happy that he took time out of his schedule during August to be with us. So in in exchange <laughs> with you, Amanda. <laughs> in exchange for that, the least you can do is take some time out of your schedule and leave us a review on how much you are loving this podcast. So whether that is on whatever podcast platform you're listening to or if you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a comment and make sure that you are subscribed in all capacities. When we come back, we're talking all things Tuscan. See you in a second. All right, Filippo, we are back. You are my Tuscan wine expert. Uh, Three times in Tuscany does not make an expert for me, but for you, it certainly does. And you know this region inside and out. It's a beloved region. Um, Is it safe to assume that it's your favorite? Well, you know, I was born there, so I'm. It's my home. It's my home, and it's a beautiful home. Uh, Tuscany is uh, uh, is a is a region with an incredible. Uh, preservation of the landscape there is an integrity of, of it like uh when you travel from florence to siena across chianti classico it's just like being a leonardo da vinci painting if you get rid of the light poles and the asphalt road you are really back in the 1500s so and that doesn't happen everywhere i mean i i love my country i love italy uh, from sicily to the alps i travel every week i'm, I'm in a different region uh, but that one thing that makes Tuscany special is the fact that you are um, in a situation where landscape has really been uh, incredibly preserved, and as well as uh, um, uh, real estate. So even when you go to wineries, these winemakers, whether the, there's been a purchase or something, they're actually taking care of everything. And you have this feeling that is not just... Uh, uh, business, there is a lot of good business, but it's also about how people care on uh, for the future. You know, like they're just guardians of something that sooner or later is going to be passed on to the next generation. And I think that's uh, that people in Tuscany have got this uh, sense of uh, of something that is yours, but not entirely yours, you know. And I think in the long run, it's paying back. It's a keen observation that I... And now that you're saying that, I think makes a lot of sense. It is, it feels very generational. It feels very, very much like they are protectors of the land. They're stewards of the land. They're not owners of it. And they're, they're there to just, to guard, to look up, to look after it. Right. And I think you see that in the way that the wines are produced, right? We're talking about European wines that have regulatory laws in place to ensure that this tradition continues. So, you know, the entire reason we have these 
DOCs and DOCGs is to make sure that it's reflective of the place. And, and so when you're getting these wines through the United States, they really reflect what's been happening. It's, you know, I think it, I think a case can be made for working outside the lines for sure. But to your point, one of the things I love about Tuscany is just this feel of generations and family. And there's a warmth to it. There's a genuineness to it that you just can't help but to fall in love with. No, there is there is that, but there is also what, what is uh, unusual about Tuscany is the fashion trends as well. You have the family, mm. but also you have here is where it's the headquarter of uh, Gucci Prada. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, Ferragamo. So yeah. Tuscany is it's pretty unique. I mean, uh, it's a uh, it's a place where you can you can be feeling totally in the middle of. Uh, of uh, preserved nature, but all of a sudden you are where everything happens, and and that's mm. that's quite quite the thing. And the wine scene is very uh, it's very contemporary. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you take a region like Chianti Classico, you get a lot of winemakers that are super tuned in with what, what's happening, and so a lo- it's 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 great to be here. I think for Americans, you know, Tuscany has become this place that we think of with very romantic eyes. Um, but it's a place that I think is still, <laughs> perhaps in a good way, very misunderstood. What do you think are some of the, the misconceptions about Tuscany that Americans might have? Well, one of the funny things is like uh, when people come to say to Florence, mm-hmm. they, were, they are in Florence and then they say, uh, how about we go to Tuscany tomorrow? Mm. And Florence <laughs> is the capital of Tuscany. Right? And you're like, in Tuscany. And, and that's, Tuscany is perceived as a... Uh, country land mm. which it, it is but it's uh it's a big region and uh sometimes people feel that is uh, a little bit even too too touristy you know mm. because if you go to florence uh, it's true that there are a couple of avenues where you need like almost like a sword <laughs> to, because you don't to go across but it's a it's like if you if you just get the parallel alley to the main road all of a sudden you are in the middle of Renaissance city. So I think one of the things about about Tuscany is that uh, you've got to be wanting to lose yourself, you know, Mm. just uh, get lost so that you can find your way back. I mean, there is a lot, there is a lot to discover. Um, It's much broader than people think. Most people would go to Florence. Of course, you have to go to Florence uh, and Siena. Uh, but uh, and a lot of wine people would go to Montalcino, they would go to Montepulciano, uh, but very few people would uh, make their way southwest on the Tuscan coast uh, in uh, the Morellino di Scanzano region or the Maremma region uh, that is like the Wild West, uh, or on the northern side, uh, past uh, Pisa, going towards Luca, going towards Liguria, that is a coastal and inland area that is totally to be discovered. So it's pretty, it's, Tuscany is much bigger than what people think. What do you think is the best way to attack Tuscany? Like, do you start and do you spend a few days in Florence and then go out to County Classico or like how, like first time Tuscany, how would you do it? Yeah. I mean, Florence, it's a mass visit. I mean, it's not because I was born there, but, but truly, you know, like if you wake up early in the morning, she's she's a beauty. I mean, Florence is a beauty. It's like uh, you 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 take a walk from Piazzale Michelangelo, and you have the whole city with the Duomo, the Dome of Brunelleschi. That still today engineers don't know how he managed to build this dome without any scaffoldings. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah, uh, it's amazing. it gives you uh, goosebumps. And then uh, you have the Arno River, the old bridge, the Ponte Vecchio. And you see the sunset at the end of it. It's just like, it is magic. Even for me, you know, I've seen it every day. It's, it's bloody unbelievable. And then you go see the Leonardo da Vinci uh, paintings, the Michelangelo stuff. Uh, actually, the David of Michelangelo. So you, you're going to get sick on, of, of, of beauty. So Florence, is, you've got to visit. From Florence, it's quite interesting because you, there's a, in the outskirts, you can find a lot of... Uh, uh, farmhouses where you can hang out if you don't want to stay in town. Mm. Um, you can visit for sure the Chianti Classico region. Chianti Classico for me is one of the greatest wines on planet Earth uh, and it's becoming better and better. Wine that can age for 40, 50 years, but is when you drink it young, it's zippy, 
reactive, it's fresh, it's juicy, lots of red fruit, and it's nearby. It's like uh, you just hop in a car and in 20 minutes you're in the first winery. Mm. So Chianti Classico is an easy way to uh, approach it from Florence or from Siena, from the southern end. Once you get to Siena, uh, you can also visit, you, you pass San Gimignano, UNESCO World mm. Heritage Site where you can taste uh, Vernaccia di San Gimignano, uh, the only Tuscan white DOCG. Uh, then from there, you can go to Brunello di Montalcino, uh, where you can uh, try... Montalcino is like, a, like a, an oasis in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, and then some of the greatest uh, wines in the world are made. San Giovese is the king of Tuscan varieties, so most wines in Tuscany assume that they are Sangiovese based, uh, which is an indigenous variety with a thin skin, a little bit like Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. but with more acidity and and a little bit more tannins, I would say. You know, once you've done the inland part, I would just say go to the coastal area. And, and maybe we can talk about it more, but this, in a nutshell, on the coastal area, you find more um, sunny driven style wines, more, some people would say more Californian style. Uh, you come across to more Bordeaux blends. Uh, the famous Sassicaia and Ornellaia are produced there. So uh, you, you come across wines maybe with a little bit more uh, muscularity, bigger, bolder style wines. Um, but also when you go more southern, on the southern part of the coast, uh, then you can meet um, like Morellino di Scanzano, which is... Uh, juicier, simpler, more ready-to-drink kind of a Sangiovese. I just did another podcast with Laura Coffer and Eduardo on smart buys from iconic regions. And one of Eduardo's recommendations, because he was in Tuscany out on the coast, one of his recommendations was Morolino di Scansano for being a little bit more affordable, but still having that sort of, you know, that it's bulgary, right? So it still has that you know, that super Tuscan kind of feel, but for a fraction of the price. Um, I'm so glad that you you feel that way about Chianti Classico, although I can't say I'm that surprised because when I was there, so the first time I went to Tuscany, I went to Montalcino and I I, I was invited by Biondi Santi, which is wild. Um, but then we went on to Chianti Classico and we went to a couple, pro couple properties and I was really blown away by what I tasted. And then my, both of my subsequent visits, I've tasted in Chianti Classico. And this last trip was really focused on the region of Chianti Classico. And my takeaway from it was that the wines were so good across the board, yeah. even, you know, at the entry level. And it just seems to me like every time I go back and every time I try Chianti Classico again, the wines just keep getting better and better and better. And it's a wine that I think that we're sleeping on a little bit here in the U.S. that I think we can still get for really affordable price um, and super, super high quality. So Chianti Classico has got uh, 7,000 hectares only, which is roughly uh, like 20, 18,000 acres altogether. That's 350 winemakers. Uh, and they're all family-run businesses. They've been making some of these... There is actually there in Chianti Classico the oldest and still living winery in Italy. They started off in 11, 1141. Wow. 1141. But that's, you know, the, the old history. What is good about Chianti Classico for me today is the fact that the winemakers are worldly. They've been traveling a lot and they always have been uh, uh, making wines with Chianti Classico uh, produced with Sangiovese and they're True vigneron. That's, I think, what makes a difference is the true vigneron. One of the biggest, biggest uh, issues with Chianti Classico, one of the reasons why maybe in the U.S. and actually all over the world there's uh, some difficulties is because of the word Chianti. Mm. So you know how this is Tuscany, this is Chianti, this is Chianti Classico. So it's a tiny portion. And Chianti, there's a lot of Chianti, which is, tends to be a ready-to-drink... Uh, easier wine, usually with not much aging potential. Chianti Classico is where everything began, right? So mm. uh, Chianti Classico uh, has got like uh, the, the Annata level, which is like uh, usually very young style wine, like the latest vintage would be last year. And it tends to be with a lot of uh, sour cherries, uh, very, very light bodied uh, uh, with a lot of refreshing acidity. 
the Reserva tends to be a little bit bolder. And then you have the Gran Selezione, which is a Chianti Classico with more ambitions. Usually is uh, the wine must come, uh, the grapes must come from uh, the owner's vineyards only. And it has to age for 30 months. Expectations is to find something with a little bit more shoulders, more body, more character as well. Uh, the great thing about Chianti Classico is also the aging potential and food friendly like no others. The other thing that I discovered was um, in at least in the Gran Selezione category, we're going to start seeing the UGA labelings. So you're going to start seeing like the Panzano, Rada, yeah. Grave. So there, I think the quality is even continuing to improve even beyond what we've seen in the last, you know, few decades. I think for Americans, when we, to your point about Chianti, one of the things that we think about are, you know, Chianti and the fiascas, right? We think of those yeah. small baskets, you know, on our little, trattori, not even trattorias, but, you know, our Italian restaurants here in the States. Um, and there is a distinction between what we're talking about, Chianti Classico versus straw basket very, very different wines. I mean, massive, completely massive. different category even. Yeah. In terms of uh, what you would eat with Chianti Classico, I mean, you go to Italy and you go to Tuscany and you sit down at a restaurant and pretty much everything on the menu works with Chianti Classico. But what are some of your favorites? You know, if you're a meat eater, Bisteca La Fiorentina is smashing. Yeah. So like a T-bone steak, like this big and, you know, only seven minutes and seven minutes on the side. Uh, juicy. Uh, if you don't eat meat, uh, I actually don't eat much meat, to be honest, but um, yeah. the great thing about Chianti Classico is that the zippy acidity of the wine is just perfect with a lot of, uh, uh, say something about uh, a Parmigiana, you know, mm. mozzarella, aubergine, tomato, mozzarella, aubergine, tomato, and then maybe like some smoked tomato cheese on top. That would be perfect. Yeah. Uh, what else is good with it? Uh, you know, like uh, uh, some dry cheese always works well mm -hmm. with Chianti Classico. Mm -hmm. um, even when you go on the Annata, the, the, the more recent vintages, I uh, don't mind it with fish, with some uh, mm. tomato fish soups is actually really good. Did you pop into the the lunch we did at Dario Cicchini's place in Panzano? Of course. Of course. I wasn't yeah. going to miss that I for thought... uh, the world. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know what I was walking into. And that was, that ended up being like one of my favorite meals in childhood, maybe one of my favorite meals ever. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you was like, you know, there is obviously a lot of American tourists. He's, Dario Caccini is very, very popular and famous, but is it seen as a touristy place or is it a place that like, you know, as a local, you actually enjoy going? When you have a character like Dario, that is, you know, yeah. bigger than life, you know, he, he would sing, so he would just grab the steaks from the fire and, and, and he would go like, to beef or not to beef, you know, that kind of guy. It's just like, uh, so some people don't like that theater, mm -hmm. but the quality the Dario uh, selects, you know, the, is just phenomenal. So there's a lot of people from Florence that just go there on purpose. Yeah. And I'm one of them. Yeah, I thought it was fun. The The meat was fantastic. For those who are, have no idea what we're talking about, just just Google Dario Caccini and you'll – there's actually a great Netflix chef's table on him. But it's this restaurant uh, that lives above um, his his butcher shop, and it's it's nothing fancy. It's, you know, basically one long communal table. You'll be sitting there. Very laid back. Very laid back. Very laid back, yes. And, and very simple. There's wine on the table, and it's just, you know, meat that comes around. You know, every, every five, 10 minutes, there's a new cut of meat. So you won't leave hungry, but it was one of my favorite experiences. You know, that restaurant is in, in Panzano, uh, which is a, a very sweet little town. We stayed in uh, Rada. We also went down to Grave. If you're going to Chianti Classico, where do you think is a good, should you stay in one of the towns? Should, where do, where would you stay? Well, you know, some people, um, a lot of uh, Americans love to do their family reunions and they usually rent a whole villa, maybe like for, yeah. for with the, the, you can find, you know, villas up to 14 uh, rooms with then suite bathrooms and everything, swimming pool and all that. I mean, it's, it's smashing. Or you can go into, to have a more of a local uh, experience. You can book mm -hmm. a bed and breakfast in uh, any town, any town from Florence to Siena, 
you're going to encounter at least 11 towns like the UGA. So you have San Casciano on the northern side, closer to Florence, uh, where it's very pretty. You have uh, uh, Barberino Tavarnelle, which is also very pretty. And then you get down all the way down to Siena, Gaiole, uh, Radda, Castellina in Chianti, Panzano, Greve. I mean, any of these town is a very multi-pittoresco kind of town yeah. where you can have a lot yeah. of fun. You can walk up in the morning, wake up in the morning and go for to buy your newspaper and just get your Italian breakfast and see people around. There's going to be uh, market, street markets uh, in, in all these little town uh, towns. So I think that's, uh, that's an experience I would recommend. I can't imagine there's any wrong ways to experience Chianti Classico. <laughs> yeah, like, it's very safe as well. It's 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 lovely yeah. anywhere you go. I think it's just really a function of like what kind of experience you want to have. Because to your point, you can rent big villas. There's hotels. There's agriturismos. There's bed and breakfasts. There's a lot of different ways to experience, and I, I they're all really beautiful. Like I don't think you're going to be lacking for uh, for scenery. It's just a function of like where do you want to where do you want to yeah. visit? What do you want to do? what are your primary objectives on the trip? And if it's just to relax, well then, you know, take that into consideration because a lot of the places that we went to um, on this last visit actually had, you know, accommodations on property and restaurants on property. So it was, it was nice yeah. to be at a place that did so, so, so much. Um, and I, you know, I think one thing that I'll do for those of you who are listening, I will, I'll put together a list of all the places that I stayed that will, I'll put on um, our Instagram if you're following us there and then I'll put it in, in the description as well. We talked a lot about Chianti Classico. I've got Brunello di Montalcino in my glass, which, as you said, you know, a very different expression of Sangiovese. This is uh, Sangiovese Grosso, um, which was originated, as as we talked about earlier, by Biondi Santi um, many, many years ago. Montalcino is a really, really cool place, though it is significantly smaller than Chianti Classico. Is, is this a place that you'd spend like one or two days in, or do you think there's more to do in Montalcino than, than just that? If you're a wine lover, there is so many wineries to visit. Uh, there is 250 altogether. Uh, Montalcino is uh, on a hilltop. It's very cool even during summer because it's, uh, it's quite high. Um, you are in the middle of the countryside, so you must either love wine <laughs> or if you like... Uh, you know, bicycle, you can just uh, browse around. You can uh, go to the sea from Montalcino in one and a half hours. You can uh, dip in the water. Mm. Um, it's it's more remote. You don't have big cities near it. So it's just uh, yeah. the task and experience that you're going to have is going to be way more countryside yeah. than than you would have in Chianti Classico. Uh, um, but, but it's beautiful. I mean, if you go there in October, yeah. November, you're going to come across white truffles. Uh, you can do a truffle hunt, which is very nice. Um, so uh, more remote, maybe if you like uh, your hardcore shopping, uh, <laughs> two, three days in Montalcino will be enough because you won't find, uh, you'll find more artisan kind of shops and uh, yeah. not the big firms uh, like you would find in Florence or Siena. We stayed in Montalcino and like I said, we went to go visit Biondi Santi. Um, and I, you know, the the little town of Montalcino has a great little tourist center where you can kind of go and get an overview of the land. The wines do tend to be more expensive in Montalcino. The Brunello de yeah. Montalcinos tend to be more expensive just across the board, um, particularly because of of how they're made. And, you know, obviously it's a smaller place, so there's less land, so supply and demand. This one that we're drinking today is actually uh, this is this is a, a co-op basically. So this is a, a cooperative of, of vintners that make this wine um, from a few different places. Um, but I really love it. You know, the thing with the the Brunellos that I find, and I don't know if I think that you probably feel this as well. These wines just take so long. You know, and the way that Chianti Classico can be can be ready to drink very young. Brunello di Montalcino, you know, while delicious young, you know, this is a 2017. It's still a baby, and I hope I've had this sitting in my glass now for over an hour, and it's still just starting to open. It's the kind of wine that you can kind of, if you're going to drink it young, you can drink over the course of a few days and still have it be really delicious and continue to open, 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 open. Have you found that to be the case with Brunellos, or am I just crazy? Um, Brunello di Montalcino is a wine 
uh, with more ambition, of course. I mean, it's, it spends five years by law in the cellar. So it tends to have a bigger structure uh, in general. The great thing about Montalcino, though, is just that you have that Mediterranean herbs, uh, ripe red fruits, but also, so you have at once both the structure and sometimes a little bit of the austerity you talk about, but also uh, the sweet fruit. Mm. Uh, then it depends also on the winemakers, you know, like different winemakers would make wines differently. Yeah. Um, on the vintages right now, uh, the 17 vintage is out in the market and it's been a very hot vintage. The wines tend to have uh, quite a lot of uh, big structure, tannins, a lot of generosity. The 2018 vintage uh, uh, has been a little bit lighter uh, style vintage. Uh, more appro- maybe more approach, more more fresher style vintage. And in November, so in a few months, we'll be tasting the Emprimer Brunello di Montalcino uh, 2019, mm. which will be in the market in 2024. Ambition's a really good word for this wine. Like it, it's big, but it you know it still has it. There's a there's a restraint. There's a class to this wine. Um, I think if you're sitting with this at home, all of the things that we had just talked about that work with Chianti Classico really work with Montalcino, Brunello di Montalcino as well. But you can, you can amp it up. I mean, you can go full on like steak with this wine. I mean, you can, you can treat it almost like a Napa cab. The biggest difference is this is, this has way more acidity than a Napa cab is going to have, um, which makes it a lot more parable. Usually there is less uh, new oak in, Mon- in Montalcino. The tradition with Biondi yeah. Santi is to have the, the massive, uh, it's called Slavonian oak, which is like a Eastern European oak, uh, which tend to be non-intrusive uh, when it comes to, it's not toasted. Uh, so usually Brunello di Montalcino is produced with the bigger barrels. There are some uh, modern, you know, you would say style Brunello mm-hmm. uh, that might have a little bit of more oak, uh, and that's when you might come across to some of the, uh, the wines tend to have a little bit of more of that astringency and extractiveness, uh, uh, which maybe is the reason why you, you should wait a little longer. But in general, things are changing. Brunello di Montalcino tends to be uh, quite... Sangiovese is only transparent. You can always read your tasting notes through the wine. And that's one yeah. of the things about Sangiovese that you always need to keep in mind. A Sangiovese is a grape that I didn't understand until I went to Tuscany and started tasting it there. And I think even if you're tasting it at home and you, you've never been to Tuscany, you're like, I like this. It's okay. I I encourage you to like to book a trip to this region because I think you'll really start to appreciate it and not only appreciate it, but fall in love with it. Um, oh, yeah. Growing up there, you know, I, I, ass- I assume it's easy to fall in love. But I think growing up here where we have, you know, slightly different palate, we eat different things, we don't understand things in the way that someone who grew up there maybe would. Um, this is where traveling to the region is so important. We've talked about where to stay, where to go. Um, you you mentioned something that I have done before and I love doing and I will continue to recommend doing. And I think you actually maybe have some good recommendations for this, which is doing classes while you're there. So truffle hunting, cooking classes. I mean, there's a lot that you can do in Tuscany and it's not like, I mean, it is a touristy thing to do, but you should, I think you should definitely do it. I, I had so much fun doing that in, on all of our trips, but um, anything that you would direct people to do in that way? I mean, you have so much going on right now. I mean, everywhere you go, you can learn how to make pasta. And that's so, such a simple thing to do, but also so uh, uplifting. Um, whatever you go in, whether you go in a farmhouse or in the cities, you're going to have opportunity I mean, I have a school, it's called Mama Florence, and it's a cooking school uh, that I've uh, founded together with uh, my partner a few years ago, and, and you can have every day there is an experience that you can do. Tuscany can really be done on a multitude of price points. Um, you know, your restaurants are not crazy expensive in the way that we see them here in California. So, you know, just keep that in mind for budgeting purposes, like always look up to the menus, but um, even your simplest chacherias are so delicious and they can be very, very inexpensive. And of course, if you go to a three Michelin starred restaurant, it's going to be expensive, but, um, yeah. don't be wary of a place if it looks really inexpensive because a lot of places just are. Above all in the, in the less known regions, 
Yes. Yeah. And like, you know, we had, we had dinner at, um, uh, in La Mole, I think it was like Restaurante de, de La Mole, and it was wonderful and, and had beautiful views of Tuscany and was like, you know, the only restaurant that really exists in La Mole. And There's Piazza only Classico. one place. Was, yeah. There was only one place in La Mole. <laughs> yeah. And it was great. And it was not crazy expensive and it had beautiful views. Um, it wasn't Michelin star, but the food was wonderful. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to go wrong. Right. Um, I can see that it's getting dark there. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you go back to your, to your European holiday. But thank you so, so much. I will, I will direct, where should I, I direct people to follow you on Instagram? Yes, Instagram is good. Um, it's my name. So Filippo with a dot in Filippo dot Bartolotta. But I mean, you, you can, you can do the link. That's the be best way. I'm going to put up a, a new website coming in September where you can follow some of my journeys and trips that I do while I am in, in Italy. And, um, Every once in a while, I'm over in in the USA, so maybe we can uh, we can organize a tasting together, Amanda. Yes, yes. Let's bring Tuscany and California together, two of our favorite places. Thank you so much. <laughs> For those of you who are uh, are, are want to learn more, I'll link everything below. Um, once again, we have the 2017 Cantina di Montalcino, Brunello di Montalcino. If you're not part of the Wine Access and Filtered Wine Club. This is your moment to get on it. Subscribe. We've got a new shipment coming out very, very soon. So uh, thank you so much for listening. It's always a pleasure to see you, and I hope to see you again. I'll be in Italy pretty soon, so maybe we'll link up um, in, uh, in, in Italy in November when I'm there in Verona. So cheers to you. Enjoy the rest of your holiday, and cheers to all of you out there listening. Bye. Cheers. Ciao, Amanda. Ciao.